By the way, on our last tape, we really did, we really did manage to capture the flavor of that rudder. Think you're going to be happy with that, Joe? Now we worked on that fillet area. We worked on putting the ribs in there. Next thing I want to do is I want to get that hatch for the adjustable controls. Getting that hatch in there is going to be one of the things. I mean, we may or may not need it. We really didn't need it on the uh, Spitfire. We only used it to change the slop in there. Really didn't make a lot of adjustments. We had all the aerodynamics pretty close on the first shot, and I hope that's going to be the case with this too. But we'll put the hatch in anyway. It's cheap, cheap insurance. Now one of the things that's always a good trick, you know, we made this polyester fillet here. One of the things that's always a good trick, get it up by the heating vent. It's been sitting up there for a while, so that should be ready to sand. But in the meantime, I want to lay out that hatch. Now on the original Spitfire, we had adjustable controls, and of course we will be making our own horns and have the various adjustments. We really didn't use them. We had the overlap here. Well, we did use that once to fine tune the uh, the up to down ratio but we really didn't do any of the other experiments that of course we we got blown out 72 days of construction work but in the meantime it may be that the sea fire goes on to be uh, a better or worse plane that we'll want to keep for many seasons and we'll have time to do all these tests so I want to make a pattern up first of all I know what size the hatch should be and I know what size the doubler in there should be but I want to lay this out first and I'll take it right off the Spitfire plans and replicate it because it works so well. And we did have an evolutionary process. We relocated the screw and the little tab mechanism. So all that, again, from the Spitfire thing, we want to take all the stuff that really worked well. One of the things that uh, we had the aluminum screw that Frank McMillan gave us, that was kind of neat. But, but that was one of the things I'm sure if we had the whole rest of the summer to play, we could have found some more performance in there one way or another. Now the Spitfire had exactly an 18 inch tail moment arm. The Seafire, because of the difference in fuselage, is going to have smaller elevators and a 19 inch tail moment arm. It's going to have a shorter stab to span by an inch, and Joe hasn't even finished the stabs yet, but what, is, what we're going to have is a longer tail moment. It'll give us that much longer, thinner body look that the Seafire has, and especially with the bubble canopy. The other thing too is uh, and, I, and again, I, I'm not sure how exactly we're going to do this, but it's with the 19-inch tail moment arm, I've lengthened the fuselage, and I think maybe some of this filleting back here will be different. I have the block all carved and hollowed, but some of that filleting may or may not be a little different because of the bubble canopy. I won't have all that material up there. The first thing I want to do is get a real accurate reference for the 19-inch tail moment arm. So I measure this down. And this will be exactly where the hinge line is. I need to add an inch. It's an 18 inch ruler. And what I can do here is interpolate and this will be my my tail moment. Now the hatch will be on this side of course. I just want to interpolate right down this. Now we know the stab is going to sit right on this flat surface and it's a flat tail. We know this is 19 inches. So now I can, again, this is what's nice about having accurate Bob Mark 10 plans. I can trace out that and just make myself a little pattern for exactly where I know some of the things that can happen is the hatch can run, the horn can run into the screw. The, the latch was a little bit crazy the first time I made it. I had to go back and remake it. But getting this accurate, having it all doped out on our plans is so convenient. Now one of the reasons for not having square corners is the corners don't really make for a nice accurate hatch when you're all finished trying to get that final little fit. Corners are always a pain in the neck. This shape worked well on a spit. And again, I'm trying to use all the parts off the Spitfire that, that really have evolved into a successful plane. All right, I know this is going to be, and I'm just putting a scratch in here. This is going to be the tail moment arm. Now I also know this has got to sit back and down about a quarter of an inch 
if I remember right. In fact, it's, it's a little lower. See, this is the kind of stuff you don't remember right away. Well, I just want to do this real light for now, and then I'll press it in with a template. Boy, when you think of how much time you can save when you have a good set of plans to work from, it's unbelievable. When we did this the first time, everything was so time-consuming because we were really without a set of good plans. Now it seems like you can just go through this. It'll lead, What I hope it's going to ultimately lead, allow me to do is have a lot more details, and I mean the cannons. I want those cannons. Cannonball laterally. I want cannons on this plane, sliding canopies, pilots. Hope George Enot is working on our pilots aggressively. Even something as silly as just where to locate the screw that it's out of harm's way and all of that aggravation. Even something that simple. Once you have plans, it's so easy to work with. Now, needless to say, this is a, a really perfect time to whip out a new blade. I'm trying to maintain a very slight draft angle, so in effect, this hatch will be like a cork. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it, though. Just one of those things I'm going to try. It, this is sea grain wood and there's hard spots. That's the problem. You run into a hard spot and a knife wants to wander. Right there, there's a hard spot. Yeah, I'm trying to keep the edges as nice as possible because the less sanding I have to do, the nicer and tighter the fit will be. And those hatches really did fit nice on the spits. I just want to keep that edge. I don't want to make these any smaller than they already are. As soon as I get the fit that I want, I'll seal this all up with thin CA. That'll keep the edges nice and square. This has a nice coat of thin CA on it. I can dress that edge off. Again, I want to seal the edges before I put that 64th plywood reinforcement. And I'll steal that right off. Hey, we know this hatch system worked well, so we're just going to replicate it right off the plans, in fact. I looked all around the shop. I couldn't find something exactly that diameter, so I settled for the old, uh, I guess this is part of what you have to be a little creative about. Very important you get these edges sealed up nice right at the beginning. Otherwise, once you chew them up, oh man, what a pain. Let's make sure I have a nice even clearance all around. Nice. What I'm going to do, I'm going to remove a little piece of this doubler, but not remove the carbon fiber so that I can get the, the 64th plywood, the little reinforcement to go right around that, just, just exactly like the Seafire plant, the Seafire Spitfire plan show, and get that with the grains going straight up and down. We're trying to create rigidity in the up and down part of the twist, not front to back. I don't really care about front to back. Up and down is where this is going to want to twist. Now, the Spitfire was a much narrower body, and the clearances back here, I remember when I put the push rod and the elevator horns and everything, all the clearances were really critical, so I'm hoping this body is about a quarter of an inch wider all the way down, that what we'll wind up having is a little more uh, free play, a little more room to move around back here. 
Again, I don't want to take the carbon off. I want to carve right up to the carbon, but not take the carbon off. And that'll tie into the plywood real nice. Okay, you can see now I'm just going to trace that piece of plywood, that 64th plywood right off the plans, be able to drop it right down in there. Bevel off all the edges, of course. I don't want to have a stress riser where the plywood ends and balsa begins. I try to taper that edge down just a little bit. Again, more details. And it probably makes it a little bit lighter in the process. But the side that's going to actually touch the stab, to stiffen the stab up, I'm going to leave that just plain, just solid. I just want to do a little test fit. And get a rough idea. This is just. Okay, that's fine. I do because I'm going on to that carbon fiber. I want to put a piece down here so this will actually sit nice and flat. I have that, that Bob Violet ribbon. This would be a good place. It'll also stiffen up the area by the blind nut. Now what this will do, this will space it out exactly the same amount as the carbon that's already going down the fuselage. And I guess I ought to put a piece there too. Alright, that'll space it out and give me a little extra stiffness but almost no extra weight. And I'm just laying out where the blind nut will be on this, even though I don't want to. I don't want to put that reinforcement in until I cut all my angles. Now I want to put some thick CA on here so it'll be gap filling. I don't want to have so much that it all oozes out and screws up my edge. I'll put a little bit of carbon because I'm going to have a stiffening the piece of plywood there of course just to make it that both sides are relatively stiff and this will also if the push rod ever comes out this will keep it from wearing through the side of the uh, fuselage or if slop develops this will be a good wearing point. Okay, so I'm going to lay out the, uh, the relief on this leave the room for the blind nut of course don't forget that and I can cut this out, just dremel it out. my location of the screw. I have this hatch. Hopefully that we know that we have good alignment. We'll use one to line up the other. The trick is here is drill through the hatch and the plywood all at the same time. There's our marker. Now I want to recess into this piece. This is a piece of 30-second plywood. I want to just have that little edge. 
And what I'll do is I'll first I'll cut this out, of course. And what I want to do with this little piece is just recess it right into the corner. And all this is going to do is keep the the uh, screw head, and we hope we'll get a counter. You can see what I did. I just relieved that little piece. The idea being that I can now CA that right in position, and that'll be my little support for that little Allen head screw, or if we can get a countersunk screw. I want to harden this whole, the side that goes inside the fuselage, harden the whole thing with thin CA. We'll stiffen it up without adding a whole lot of weight. Now, the easiest way to drill these holes is with a Dremel tool with a pointy grinder. Anytime you try to drill a hole through this kind of stuff, the drill goes halfway through and it goes whoop, right throughout the other side of the body. So to avoid that, that's one nice little way to do it. Now, we still have to put a little piece of plywood behind here. Now I have the hole marked. I'll glue a little uh, donut of plywood, maybe some eighth inch plywood, and a blind nut already right in it, and that'll, that'll be my mounting bolt. And the best way to do this is drill a hole, this is eighth inch plywood, drill a hole, press the blind nut in, glue it of course, and then go to the saw and trim it out as a donut. If you trim the donut first, you're going to have a problem. It's going to be a nuisance, it'll split and crack. Glue the nut in first, then trim it to size. That's an excellent trick. Now just wait for that CA to kick off and get over there and cut it right out. Now this has to get glued in position inside. Before we go to glue this in, I put some WD-40 on this bolt. If you don't do this, a lot of times you get that, that wonderful surprise that, oh boy, we just glued the bolt to the nut. And, boy, I love the smell of WD-40. Anyway, give that a nice second or so to dry. Then I'll actually use the bolt, whoops, I'll use the bolt to hold it in place. Put some thick CA on there and pull the bolt and pull it up into position. And you can see I'm using the bolt itself to hold that in position. We'll get some thick CA in there and just pull this up into position and hold it up while the CA kicks off. See these are the little kind of jobs that if you don't have a real good way of doing them, or if you forget the WD or one, something similar to that, it can wind up being a nightmare. And I'm just going to hold this while it kicks off. Now once that's in place, I can hit it with some thin. Oh good, it glued to the paper. I want to fuel proof that nut is what I want to do more than anything is get that I don't have a drop of oil or something work its way in there and all of a sudden that's loose. That little bag of screws that Frank McMillan contributed to our, uh, these are aluminum screws, our Spitfire program. I think I have enough, yes. And these type of screws really give it a nice finished look when the hatch is in place. And thanks again to Frank McMillan. He's the one that uh, supplied us with these last year. Now it really does give it a nice finished look. Now this little countersink as soon as I take this screw in and out two or three times, it'll leave its own little impression. I want it to be just even with the surface, and then I'll harden that up with thin CA. And of course, a final sanding over this with a block. Just block sand that in, it'll be just perfect. Now I need to make the little clip that goes up here. I need to make a little tongue that's going to be attached to the hatch, and then a little hook that goes inside, a little confinement. And that's 
going to go right on the inside of that and that'll finish off the hatch. I need to mark off exactly where this this is on the inside and what I need to do is put a little pillow block here and then the tongue will go right on top of it. Now all that's there for is to space the tongue up just a little bit. The same distance as that little that little window shelf that we uh, the little ledge that we run the hatch into. Again, this is just a little tongue to, re to keep the hatch from number one vibrating and number two. I think in the other one we had a little containment piece if I remember right on there, but I don't really think we're going to need it with this system. That might have been overkill. I don't know. We'll have to put this in and see. You can see the little notch that allows it to just key in. Okay, now, to get that clearance we need, I just run some sandpaper in there until I get a nice, a nice tight, oh my God, President Nixon's back, nice tight fit, and the screw retains that, and you can see that's as solid as can be. It's really a nice, nice system. Okay, that's good, having that hatch, pretty much a duplicate of right off the Spitfire plan, but again, I want to use all the parts that have proven to work really well. 
and try to upgrade anything I can, but, but basically use the good parts that all came off the Spitfire as much as I can. Okay, we're going to pick this up later. This has been a good session. Even just one little detail like that, you always feel like you got something accomplished. Oh, what I did, I tried. It's not working. I'm trying to put this in the rack and hold it up and then try to sight from one angle, sight the Spitfire and the Seafire both at the same time. I need to get it outside and I can't do that today. It's a, it's a terrible day out there. But anyway, we're at the point with this where pretty much the work on this one is done and the next time we get a working session we'll pick up the work on the other fuselage and you can see the next step will be the nose ring, the cowl we got cowls over there and everything it's just sitting there waiting to be worked on but for today we're out of time and that's it and that's all she wrote I really like this profile view I think this is really going to be a nice looking ship that rudder is Joe you got it right believe me I better get a mock spinner on this just to see what it looks like. Now in today's mail, and boy, this I get a letter like this every once in a while, and it it really it it really makes me feel good about the effort that I put into these tapes for uh, you know the people like like John Lickley. Now John had make a sh long story short here he had looked at some tapes on fuse construction and I know he's gonna be I don't even have to wait for the response he's already thrilled with the tapes that he's seen I'm gonna send him some more he did send me these pictures and of course I'll pass them on to Larry Cunningham now anybody knows I love semi scale anything this looks like a beauty this this has the look of oh my god I love it now I know the the checkerboard some of the P47's had this kind of trim in the back I don't really remember which ones they were, but John doesn't realize it, but Joe and I had seriously, seriously considered doing a P-40 this year. Let me go get the phone, I'll finish this. President Nixon calling. Back, sorry for the interruption. By the way, that was that was an interesting thing here. That was Art Adamison on the phone. He was looking for some lettering uh, to do a Red Baron. He's coming out with a fiberglass body kit. Now, believe it or not, Art, that's the same thing I'm trying to come out with. Uh, he's come, going to come out. I think we put these on already um, for the Red Baron. So, obviously, if anybody out there has some, some ideas or some pictures of the Red Baron, they'd like to loan Big Art, be my guest. And Art, of course, is one of the people, you know, you could really, you could really thank him. He's done so much for the event, forget about it. Okay, John, I appreciate this. I hope you're really, really using those videos. Please pass them around. Give them to Renberg, all the guys out your way. Pass them around. That's the way we'll get the most value out of all this time and energy I put into this stuff. And believe me, this stuff takes time. Thanks, John. Now, today's little project, we got a lot of touch-up to do on this guy. This little profile needs about uh, 4,000 pounds of body putty to fix him back up. Poor Don, he's out getting coffee. Anyway, you know, mask back, mask it off, repaint the wingtips. This will be a little short job. We wound up trying this stuff. I don't know if this is going to work, this uh, real, I don't know what the hell they call it, fancy body putty anyway. See if it has any molding, uh, any application up on the nose here. I don't know if it's going to work yet, but... One of the things I could be experimenting with here on this ship. Day. Not a good movie day. I don't know. Looks pretty good with the black tips. So far, yeah. so good anyway. Four year warrior. <laughs> how many? Uh, come on, how old is the plane? How old? Four 1991. years? 1991. Believe it or not, this plane has a zillion flights. He doesn't maintain it. This, Thank is, you. this is his, uh, <laughs> Thank I don't know, claim to fame, the profile king. Now, you don't know how many times I've watched this video. I'm getting sick of watching it, in fact. Nah, not possible. Anyway, but there's something I do want to share with you today. Today, my beautiful kits came in from SIG. Now, if you've never seen, and I mean, this is, this, this is a work of art. If you've never seen laser-cut kits, if you've never had one or seen one up close, they are just beautiful now. 
This is hand-selected wood. There is, there is not a piece of wood that I've seen in this whole pile so far that even comes close to being heavy wood. I mean, and this is, just to give you an idea, looking over here, if you've never seen kits, if you've never seen hundreds of fuse sides all in one place, absolutely accurate, absolutely beautiful, laser cut, every piece perfect, plywood perfectly cut. This is the kind of stuff that absolutely, if anybody's seriously looking to get a kit, boy, there isn't a better time. In fact, look, that's probably that's Santa Claus right now. Buy a kit. Ah, wing ribs, all ready to be sorted. Hmm. Now tell me, you think I sit around all day building Spitfires and sea fires? Forget it. This is a whole day's work. Sorting this, bundling it, bagging it. A lot of work. Too much work. Now day two of putting kits together. And this is this is an important thing to remember. Is each time I run a batch of kits, this in this case, this is a... Uh, the early, the late part of 96. What what I've done is make several improvements to the kit. Now, in the earlier kits, these parts were cut by saw. These are laser cut now. Just one little improvement to the kit. And I guess if anybody knows about motorcycles, they know about companies like Boltaco that used to, right in the middle of a production run, change something to make an improvement. Now, in this case, we've made some improvements to the gear clips. They were not exactly right on the, some of the earlier kits. There's some other little improvements that we've made that uh, I hope each each one of these kits is going to get to be better and better and better and better. But what I also did, I also made arrangements uh, to have sets of ribs laser cut. So if anybody, just for instance, just wanted to build a cardinal wing, supposing you want to use that cardinal wing in a Mustang or something or whatever, a Stuka, you can you can just buy a set of ribs separately and frame up the wing with your own wood nice it's a nice option that uh, not many other people have in fact i don't think anybody has it now we don't have it yet for sure but with midgley going to be here in a few days one of the things i want to try to make if we do get to do it on his ship is a mold for a cardinal cowling and it may be that in the next or one of the next batches of kits one of the options we'll have, or one of the standard things, is going to be a molded cowling. So stay tuned. Uh, and of course, we have cardinal canopies. Midgley's already got that mold working real well. So a lot of nice choices. This, this to me, is one of my little pride and joys. They're not very profitable from a point of view of, uh, you know, can you make money making kits? I don't, I don't know that you really can make, you know, pay the mortgage from this. But one of the things it does, it makes building a cardinal just a reasonably easy operation that uh, I think anybody anybody that's got a reasonable amount of energy and time can put together one of these kits and come up with a plane that'd be very competitive. And of course the plane that this was uh, totally designed from was the 1992 Concourse winner. So hey, you could do worse. There, there are uglier airplanes in the world. Anyway, back to work. Now, I really have to say, a Cardinal has been good to me. They've been good planes. The ones Midgley has, the ones that uh, Lenny Melito has, the ones that have been built in our area have been very, very good flyers. Easy to build, light wood, and a good support system for getting them trimmed out. And yes, if you're wondering, there really are cardinals in my backyard, and that's where I got the inspiration for the uh, name for the cardinal. Now, there's nothing better than at the end of a, of a long day of making kits to be done. Anyway, they're all sitting there ready for the, the new happy owners that are going to uh, be giving birth to these cardinals in the very near future. Now, in today's mail, I got a nice photo from Dan, I can't say this word right, Shavacho, from Alabama. Anyway, he's uh, 
building up several new planes. This is his latest, and he flies with his 13-year-old son. And he sent me a picture here from, uh, actually from the newspaper, and it's in color. Hey, when Joe got his, Joe Adamusco got his picture in the paper with the Spitfire, it was black and white. What gives here? Anyway, looks good, Dan, and, uh, you know, hope you enjoyed the loaner videos, and hope to hear from you soon. Anyway, here's the, I don't know if I ever put this on a video. This is from the newspaper, the local newspaper. It looks like Joe's ass is hitting the outhouse here, but actually they got it all backwards. Joe's the one flying, not me. Uh, you know, newspaper reporters, I don't know. But I still think this is the best newspaper article that's ever been written about a, uh, a model plane person. It really embarrassed the hell out of me when these people interviewed me and took pictures of everything. Unbelievable, but it was fun. And then they even came by and did another story. So, hey, we're all, new all newspaper famous. And boy, there's Cardinal pictures all over the place here. Anyway, my favorite, the 20-pointer. Before that, uh, Benedetti squinched it. Anyway. All right, back to work. Now I'm at one of the critical parts of this. I just have to calculate this out. What I usually do is, and I haven't, I haven't done that up to this point, is I, I haven't been really keeping track of the first fuselage because the first one usually comes out in the ballpark, and then I try to make a decision if I'm in the ballpark. Well, and I don't, you know, if I'm not, I build another fuselage, so it's not a problem now. When, when we started this out, the Spitfire fuselages were, were a little over 10 ounces, but they have 3 8 mounts, so I'm allowing an extra ounce for the mounts. Well, when I calculated out the weight for this, this has the half inch mounts, the whole fuselage together, this whole thing is 317. And that includes the tape, believe it or not, there's probably uh, 5 or 6 grams of tape on here. It includes the fillet in the back, the rudder. And the total weight of this, including the fiberglass cowl, is three, 317, which comes out to be 11.3 ounces. Now what that allows me to do now is, I have my component parts. What it tells me, all these shells are eighth inch and everything, everything is legit here. This is not a cheater fuselage with some kind of crazy construction. It's got a really firm nose, nice solid cowl mounts and everything. What it tells me is the second one should come out right around 11 ounces, between 11 and 12. I would even accept 12 without a problem. But if I was to build a second one and it came out to be 13 or 14, I might make another fuselage and then give this to somebody or pass it on or whatever. Uh, the reason I've been not keeping track of this is because the supply of wood that I have I, is, you know, unlimited now. I have so much wood in the house here, it's ridiculous. So if I was to run into a problem, I'll just go make up another fuselage. It's not a big deal. But I do have is, and I'll make a decision after I play with this. I don't have much time this morning. This is that 332nd top block I have. Now, if I use a 332nd top block, I may get the fuse a little lighter. I don't know. But even with the 8th inch stuff, I'm well under the 12 ounce weight limit. And I also have some decisions here. There's some things I might want to add or change to the second fuse. I don't know yet. I got, I got seven or eight cowlings now, but this is a point in time that, I guess the point that I'm trying to make, I'm not making it as well as I should. You build a nobler, and a year later you build another one. Well, you'd like to learn from the first one what you could make better, lighter, straighter, stronger. In other words, if you build the first one, and the motor doesn't run right, but it was plenty light, add some construction to the nose. If you build the first one, it's 78 ounces, and the motor runs fine, lighten up the construction a little, lighten up the paint probably. Anyway, 
with the little time I have left, I want to see how this top block, and what I did, I let this sit in the mold, this is about a week or two it's been sitting there, and I know that helps a lot, because see what happens with these, now I'm going to be delivering this to Joe soon, and I don't want these to spring, so I leave tape on it, I don't, in fact the tape's coming off yet, just to keep the form, we should be having canopies, and actually tomorrow, tomorrow or the next day, Midley's supposed to be here, but just having gone through this, I'm, now I'm more enthusiastic than ever that, that I can get these to come out really scale-like. The, these are much bigger than Spitfire bodies in girth-wise and width and everything. And I just didn't know if I was going to be able to keep in under that 12-ounce range. 11.3 is, is better than I could expect. Everything looks real nice here. So what I'm probably going to do is most of, the, most of the second fuselage, unless I make some kind of change or improvement or something, I'll do most of it off camera. Now what I've been doing is every day, I've been making up plenty of these. I got a couple of these going out to Japan, so I'll have to finish them up. The Kaz is very interesting. Oh, this one is perfect. <laughs> anyway, what I, what I finally arrived at doing here, I wound up using one layer of cloth in the final production ones one layer of ribbon around the perimeter and then I made up a little piece of carbon mat for the front where the, where the actual pin is going to be and in a spot where it gets real thin here I laid in some carbon fiber but by doing that I've got the weight to about half of what the original one was and it's still plenty still plenty strong so this is just another one of those things and if you make enough of them eventually you'll figure out just about how thin or how thick you can make them You'll get the finish to come out nice. Because one of the things, too, if we do run into having some spare time, I really want to give that, well, make some effort at making uh, a mold for a real fiberglass fuselage. Now, this West, Re West System resin is really nice material. And to me, this is so exciting because this is something I haven't seen anybody in the control line stun field that can make these jump out of the mold yet. Yeah, this is the point I want to make in my evolutionary process or my experimentation, you can see in the beginning. And this is very typical. This is what to expect if you're new to this. Well, new, I'm still new to it. I always had trouble in the very beginning with all of the molding, with the edges having a problem. Yeah. Then I made it a little bit better by mixing the paste in. Again, I got a couple that had almost no flaws in them, but they still had a little bit of chips and nicks and dings in them. But... But at some point in time, you get a feel for, and, and it's just, I'm trying to get this zeroed in so you can see, you can get each one to come out just a little bit better. Now, in the hull, here's one that had a, an air bubble, and that all can be filled. Believe me, these will all be filled. You'll never know that. But at some point in time, you're going to arrive at, and this one has a little air bubble. Next time I mix resin, I'll fix that one. At some point in time, I want to, I want to make sure I show this. It's significant to know. Now, let's see how many. I don't even know how many we made. One, two, three, four, five, six. The seventh one came out perfect. Well, there's a, me there's a method to my madness here. At the end of making, and this is, this is what I'm trying to establish here, at the end of making seven fiberglass fuselages, if I ever get to that point, it would be real nice to know the seventh one would come out of the mold perfect. Well, this molding material, I'm real excited about. You can see there is absolutely no wear and tear on that. It's like a brand new mold. So what this has given me is a real good, and I mean, this may be something that doesn't even interest an average modeler. It's given me a real good feel for building up my ideas and thoughts and how to get those edges and corners right so that eventually, if I can do this with a glass fuselage, if I can make seven fuselages and the seventh one comes out without any problem, I think I'm going to be in Fat City. Now if I can't, or if this gets postponed because of squirrels eating my house or construction work or something, well that's okay too, but it'll, it will not be because I really didn't give it a try. And maybe some people out there really don't even give a damn about molded parts, but I can tell you my feeling is, and I've, I've always considered my, my feeling to be that I was just a little bit ahead of the world or the world around me in a lot of areas. And, and I think this is one of them. I think somewhere in our future, I mean, maybe years from now, you're going to look back at these videos and laugh and say, oh, yeah, the Windy really was a little ahead of his time. 
maybe we're coming up on an era where you could even have kits that you know these if I get this technology down pat believe me if I get this technology right here you're looking at something that could change in my book it could change the world of stunt you could make this mold up for a nobler for a Thunderbird you could make this mold anything you can make this mold up for another another significant part and I spoke to Midgley about this is all of these parts never are affected by oil if you're a lazy guy and you never wipe the plane off who cares fiberglass isn't hurt by uh, oil anyway it gives me a reason to dream a reason to be hopeful a reason to think that if I'm out there rowing across the Atlantic without a map maybe somewhere down the road we'll have this but and then I'll look back at today and laugh a little bit or say hey yeah that really was cool but but this is this is what keeps me uh, totally engrossed in a hobby now I hope you don't mind me rambling on about my my little thoughts and whatever you want to call them this morning this is that piece of 332nd and I know from past they see this is the stuff that you learn when you do this over and over and over you learn that if you leave it in a mold for a week it's better than if you take it out the next day so obviously one of the nice things would be and I never thought of this is I can take the parts once they're all finalized now you can't do it with the bottom block because you have the scoops but like the top block I can take the top block off and actually put it right back on the mold Ooh. This is that piece that has a joint in it. And I, what I really wanted to see from this, this was not a great piece of wood. I wanted to see if I could somehow bury or hide that joint. And it looks like that's going to be doable. It's, it's, hey, I'll tell you, when, eh, this, this is so, I, I mean, I don't know how the real world looks at this, but every time I take one of these out, I just think of Midgley behind the garage with that carbon block taking all like the wood out of there I think oh my god when I remember that when we made the fuse construction video I remember sitting back there he was on Jeff's motorcycle carving and hollowing and cutting my whole backyard was full of chips and then I think how nice it is unwrap the band-aid and you have a a top block anyway I'm gonna trim this one off off camera because I'm actually see I didn't really even know if I was going to be able to use this piece with the seam but what I'm going to do is give it a shot now because this is 332nd not 8th I'm going to have to put some reinforcements up in the nose here I know that but again you know if if that first fuselage had come out at 15 ounces then I would right away be thinking uh oh I better start molding everything out of 332nd now I've heard from other people Dully Warwich, I believe, used 77 thousandths wood. This is 93 thousandths. So it may be that we could even get some, you know, maybe we could even mold these lighter. I don't know. And another thought is on molding is you can always make this out of two or three pieces of thinner wood like we did the Spitfire Turtle Deck and put a laminate in between, some glass cloth, some resin. There's a lot of ways of doing it. But the thing I like about doing this way is all the glass cloth will be on the surface, and we will especially if we wind up using this in the final fuselage we'll wind up with double or triple cloth up in the front and the reason I'm not really concerned with having this top be a real solid piece of wood right now is because I'm going to have those big blisters as reinforcements and I'm definitely going to fiberglass the nose on this and the biggest reason for fiberglass in the nose is guys picking up that plane and that's another thing that's really a, a something to consider is if you're a guy that flies along with a stooge yeah you can control who picks up your plane but in the real world of flying at the circle burner field and flying with all the guys I fly with somebody with rings and dings and watches and, and armadillos on their fingers and stuff is always putting things in that plane and it's always nice if you can make it bulletproof so anyway I'll trim this up off camera I'm kind of excited and I probably won't get back here to work on this but I'll get all the trimming done and yeah, the beautiful thing about living in Jersey this time of year is we have 80 million leaves in the backyard and I have a free volunteer for tomorrow to help me so maybe I can finish off the leaves and get back here and work on this tomorrow. Now I just thought there's one thing I'd, I thought I'd mention here because this is this is definitely something you can put to good use. Let me get the ring. Since I had the nose ring all made up already I'm not going to have time to fit this up this morning, but I just wanted to get an idea of how these parts would come out. Now what will happen, because this is 332nd and not 8th, it's going to be a little bit smaller when I get the final fit in here. But what I can do now, because I made the mold oversize, and 
Just watch what happens up in the front here. I can move that just a little bit up until it matches when I do the actual fit. See, these are the things I didn't have to do with the eighth inch piece until it actually matches up with the nose ring exactly how I want it and I can trim the front. Now see I have the back plenty of material I, I, I actually have almost an inch of variation so one of the things that might be worth mentioning here is when you make up the mold let the wood hang off the back let the wood hang off the front won't really matter because you'll always want to make it bigger not smaller but you even could consider one of the things you could consider is let the wood hang off the front a little bit this will allow you a little bit of, because the, basically the rest of it is going to be pretty much the same shape. And if it isn't, you can squeeze it a little bit. See, this is, this is the part of molding that people don't understand, is once you have this mold made, if you put this on a, on a 40 size fuse, you can just do that. Yeah, 90% of it is going to be okay. Maybe you're not going to fit up in the front. But that's okay, because now you can just move it forward, move it back until you get exactly. Now I don't know exactly when we're going to get to that fit that we really have perfect, but I'll have the nose ring on at that time. So, <clears throat> Now another thing too is even on these little sessions in the morning like this, I get a little time, I think about what I'm going to do in the next session. I always get some ideas. I'm always thinking, what can I do next? How can I skip a step? How can I make something faster or quicker or easier or whatever? Now. One thing I'm, I'm totally convinced of now, I can make the shells out of 332nd. Number two, I can put the seam in here. This seam, I haven't even sanded this yet, and this seam is, for all purposes, invisible. Once I put this back on the mold and sand this down a little bit, but keep in mind, if it's 332nd, you don't want to do a lot of sanding. Just dust it off with some 400 or whatever, and that's it. But it just gives us one more choice. And the reason I'm real excited about knowing this is there might be a time, and it, it may be that we're coming up on that time. I always look to the future. I always spend a lot more time maybe than an average person thinking about things that, that might be coming up in the future. And one of the things I'm hoping is, if not the fiberglass, at least for sure this is in the bank. This is something that every single person that builds a model can take advantage of. Every single person can take advantage of this technology. Every single person can take advantage of fiberglass cowlings. That's stuff that's in the bank. And it all, every time I have a little success with something, then I kind of get all excited about looking forward to how can I build on this and make this even better for the future. And, and, and of course, I'm constantly thinking about the day that you can make a fiberglass body ship or even make a kit, pretend it was a sea fire kit. You take out the take out the body shells, glue them together, and put the wing in. Boom. Put the motor mounts in. Boom. How nice, instead of all that carbon and sanding, it, it actually would be the next step up from doing it this way. But we're going in steps. First, you have to learn how to run. You have to learn how to run before you can walk. Midgley, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. See, another thing I hope that comes across in the videos, because I, this is actually how I feel, is, is to get excited about building something. You know, a lot of people, they say, and I hear this all the time, I don't have any time to build. I hate building. I don't like building. Building is boring. Building is a pain in the ass. Well, I don't feel that way at all. I really look forward to this time of year. Building is, is just unbelievably fun to me. Having my friends over, being on a phone constantly with people is a lot, a lot of fun. But maybe the reason building for some people isn't as much fun as it could be or should be is the fact they don't approach it correctly. And if you approach it, boy, I tell you, these are perfect. <laughs> if you approach it with the idea, hey, it's a little bit of an adventure, and, and you try to create new things and new ways of doing things, I don't know, I get excited about it. I can't imagine that you would not be excited about it. And, and then if you can, if you come up with a great idea, pass it on through stunt news, pass it on through the videos, it's even double the amount of fun, so. I guess we're at the end of this, and I've been trying to get a little bit of a push on here because one of the things I'm going to be visiting Joe real soon, and we're going to be we're going to actually have the wing in our possession, and we'll start on all that. But but if you're not excited about building, maybe you should get excited. Maybe you should think of some way of have a dream in your mind of what you want it to be, so that you're not just grinding and carving, and yeah, uh, it's like it's like shoveling coal on a steam engine or something. That it's a little more exciting than that. Oh, by the way, I heard Dave is going to be here Sunday. So we will be we will probably be in the middle of working on this fuselage and have to put this aside.
but we're going to be doing some exciting stuff him and now that's one thing i'll say about dave he is excited about it he is he gets on a phone with walt prey gets on a phone with me and i can hear it in his voice he's excited about building so maybe you can pick up a little inspiration from dave too now the only thing i've found so far with this is by the time I got the, there were some little wrinkles up in the front of this. By the time I got them thinned out, it was really thinner than I wanted it to be. So I'm going to put a little reinforcement up in the front here. And this is probably something, if you're doing 3 32nd parts, that you'll have to do. Because it's, it just got a little bit too thin up by the nose ring, where the nose ring area would be. And I did have a little time here to do it. So it's just, it's not a big deal. And I, this I remember doing on a Spitfire too, by the way might even want to do this if you have eighth inch but again you keep keep that curve as the glue is drying and that's what I'll try to do here and I can laminate it in steps so there's no stress riser add a little bit of strength up to the nose Now in today's mail, I got some a nice photo pack. In fact, a whole album of pictures here from uh, from Miss, Mr. English in California. Mr. English, <laughs> yeah, I I really I have to say this this guy made his wife made Karen a doll last year. I was so impressed. Anyway, Bob English, and I'm I'm going through. This is this is a picture of Jim Tishy. I'm trying to read this off the back of the pictures. Uh, all rubbed out. Sig Dope, definitely a front row plane. Well, Mr. Tishy is enough videos, I'm sure. <laughs> and I'm sure he's a craftsman enough to see. This looks beautiful, by the way. I have to tell you, I am impressed. This is nice. Nice stuff. And, of course, we'll get these off to Stunt News, no problem at all. Now, the funny story was that uh, I was out at the, at the, the Nats, the Pasco Nats, where I met, I met Bob, and I loaned him some, I don't know, some muffler parts or something. And here's a, his twin, and we have the video of this flying at the Pasco Nats. This is some awesome piece of work, by the way. Anybody has never seen this, it has kind of scale exhausts and everything. See, he has some damage, the landing gear, the nose, looks like the nose wheel is broken off. He said it's from a hard landing. Okay, I'll read this caption. My new P-40 stunt, Charles Mackey Crusader wing and numbers, my fuse and tail. Bob English, 520, 570 squares, 48 ounces. Again, I think we have, oh boy. President Nixon, coming. Give me a break. I'll be right back. Hey, I'm back, and I'll just I'll pass this information on for whatever it's worth to anybody. The information I just got, I don't know if this is valid or not, was from Lone Star Balsa that he has a tremendous good supply of four-pound wood now, and he's even willing to deal in a discount on it. So uh, I may be ordering some more, even though I'm pretty well stocked up. Worth passing along. Anyway, by looking at this, OS40FP by Marshall Palmer from L.A., California, runs very well, muffler pressure. This is a beautiful airplane, by the way. And I did have a couple other pictures of this, but, but I always like to have more, you know, and especially try to get the best one or the best ones you can for stunt news. Look at the nose art on this thing. Look at the riveting detail. Now, speaking of, speaking of well-done stuff, look at this. And I'm just reading captions here. It says, all colored paint was applied with an airbrush. The blue is... Sky Sig Sky Blue with lots of white added stock. Sig Sky Blue is much too dark. Pretty much, I guess, uh, the same conclusion I came to having looked at the Sig colors when we did the Spitfire was just not appropriate colors. Now this is really nice. You know, just look at some of the detailing on this. Look at some of the detailing. The little, the little uh, release by the guns. Cockpit detail. Scale builders that's, that see it say I should be building scale, but I like to fly. I pulled a canopy myself. I don't have a vacuum former. Well, you know, you might want to consider Dave Midgley. He's got a professional vacuum former. I wasn't able to get all the blush out. 
Actually, it even looks a little more realistic. He's got the little panels and everything. I have to tell you, I know how much work this is. Anybody that doesn't know how much work it is to do all these camo and pan uh, paneling lines and riveting details, and and this should just be this more than anything else. This should really be inspiring to uh, to Joe Adamusco. That's for sure. I'm, and again, I'm reading on. It's funny how a few pieces of aluminum tubing can fascinate people. But people love guns. Hey, tell me about it. After all, this is a warbird. If you do another camo job on an airplane, I strongly recommend airbrush it using the soft separation lines. Yes, we do plan on doing that. Everyone that sees this plane likes it better than the hard lines. Good points, easy to apply, no masking. Airbrush makes a very smooth, light coat. No bad points. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I absolutely agree. The next one we do, the next one, the Seafire, will be all, if not airbrushed with an airbrush, it'll be airbrushed with... Uh, an eight ounce gun. There was a checker tail squadron flying out of North Africa. Everyone paints a shark mouth on their P-40. I wanted mine to be different. Checks were done with masking tape. Same on the fuse. R-E, I don't understand that. R-E, oh, may rudder and elevator on right side army initials. All, all ink lines were done with uh, I T O Y A pens. You can get it at stationery store. Make sure you get the the black ones, not the gray ones. That's a good tip. And I remember getting some pens, and they did work. Now that's just that's real nice. Now tell me that's not cool. But the nose art here is just astronomical. The cowl is held in place by one screw on each side. This keeps the cowl from spreading out caused by engine heat inside the cowling. Expanding the wood grain. Well, it, let's hope it doesn't expand the fiberglass too. By the way, we could, we could. I'm just looking at the way you've made this cowling. We could make that out of fiberglass in a minute for you. Just send me a plug. Exhaust stacks are aluminum tubing, bent and flared. Dope will not stick to aluminum, so I put K and B epoxy on first. After 24 hours, flat black was airbrushed on, followed by a touch of rust-colored dope. Even another idea when you're talking about those kind of stacks. Another idea, if you're going to use aluminum, uh, is get it iridited. And George has iridited up some of the uh, the pro stunt mufflers. In fact, the iridited the one that's on Strega. So, just some more thoughts. Good thoughts. Anyway, thanks a lot for the pictures, and I really do appreciate sharing this tech. Th this is as close to being what I want to do as anybody. Okay, got the nose ring in today. One little step and all little blocks. Little by little. See, this is the second time through, it always goes a little... Now in today's mail, here I'm trying to get the mail all done so I'll be ready to roll when Midgley gets here. This came from Don Boca. He built a, a very, very authentic copy of the Atom, Art Pawalski's 1958 Nats winner. It even has a real, and this is not one of the repro new ones, this is a real YNO 10.5 prop, a George Aldrich Fox 35 ABC, a real, real Froom spinner. Oh my God, hey, send me that spinner. Tell me I don't love those spinners. Anyway, just looking through, it's 35 ounces total all up weight, and he said he made very, very, very uh, effort, very, very, uh, I'm glad I can speak English. V very much effort to keep it authentic except for the addition of some carbon fiber veil and this really really does look like uh, you know if anybody goes back to that era to the era when the Steve Woolley planes and uh, the Warwich planes and everything they all had, a, had that Detroit look really really pretty plane this was this is probably as good as having a real picture of uh, the real plane. Anyway, thank him. I thank him very much for the picture, and uh, I hope he enjoys the videos on molding. Okay, Dave finally arrives here with an entourage of things to fix and repair. Notice the. <laughs> the now shortest rudder in the world, Aries. A little repair up to the nose, and this is one of the things we're going to try to do is get a reasonable good repair down there on that. He's got some interesting parts for the fuse here. Wing glassing to do. 
tail looks like it's in silver and we're going to see how much we can get in the next couple of days get done on these guys and to keep us keep us in good form and good humor that the jet game is on and they're getting their ass kicked so what we're going to do the first thing is get some bondo polyester resin up on the nose then that can be drying while we figure out what we want to do on some of the other areas that need to be repaired. Now we might have to build this up in a few thin layers, which is always a good way to do it. Even though this will draw harden in mass, I think there's no point putting on more than we really have to here. She's busy working. And we'll give this about a half hour or so to dry. Now it's always important with this stuff, if you're going to do a multiple repair, like we have several things to work on, to get the first thing done it needs to dry. So this can be drying while we're doing, we're going to figure out exactly what we want to do up by the wing tip here. There's a broken rib and some other things we need to address up here. You can see this has gone right through. We need to fix a bay here. And obviously we're going to have to make up a little piece of wood here. Let's see how much material. This is a solid rudder. I was, I was hoping it wasn't going to be a built up rib rudder and it's airfoiled on one side. So all we're going to need to do is trace that out from a piece. I hope he's got the plans or something with him here. What the hell with him. We'll make, a, <laughs> we'll make an Aries out of him. Make a cardinal just go. <laughs> okay, so we want to figure out what we're going to do here next. That's the next thing. So we're going to stop and have lunch because I want to think about how I want to do this. One of the thoughts I had was I can get in through here, come up underneath here with something, and I don't know what, and then put some ambroid in here. Ambroid blends this in relatively nice and maybe save, see now if I don't cut this bay out I have to go through four or five different letters and everything. You can't cut this in the middle of a bay, that's out of the question. So again we know we're going to have to cut through here, this is already through in fact. So while we're having lunch I'm going to try to think of some way of getting a little dowel or something in here, up onto here to fill this. And that would be, that would probably be the most uh, reasonable way to do that. Anyway we'll think about it. And by the way that's always a good idea to do that, if in doubt, think about it, don't jump. What I want to do is dress off the edge here and harden it. Dave, what I'm going to do is hit this with CA first to get it hard. It's real soft. Did you trim this down at all? Or is this just out of concrete left? It? What's that? This edge. I trimmed it down a you trimmed just it. a little bit, but that's pretty much how the concrete left it. Okay, but and it's a solid rudder. Yeah, see, solid but the, the stuff's peeling away here. Right, see what it's I'm almost like the concrete. Right, shit right. Got so we got to first become, harden it it's up. It's got to come down. First harden it up before you do anything. Otherwise, it's going to be soft, hard, soft, hard. You want to get all the material the same consistency before you can go on any further. All right, otherwise you have soft, hard, so you, you know, it's going to be a totem pole by the time you're done. This happened, remember in 87, this happened to a tradition, yeah. when I almost hit Taffender. Taffender was judging, I came around and inverted, the motor <laughs> shut off. Duck, Doug! I bet he never forgot it. I had to do this repair right on the field, in fact. In fact, during that, and this is real interesting, during doing that repair is when I actually met Ken Budensink for the first time, and he proposed uh, what became the Ken Windy video adventure of a lifetime. Started out my business, repairing a rudder. Okay, get a little piece. You want the grain going front to back now. Otherwise, you're going to have all end grain up there. No, that's fine. And cut it oversized. We'll trim it to fit. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that'd be all right. enough. Now we just happen to have Aries plans here. Now I want you to make sure this is the official. Mine is bigger than yours, Aries. This is not the uh, the original one, but the second original one that was then the 
third original. I don't even know what these plans are. Though. But you better make it just a little oversized and you'll be safe. Oh, these are windy plans. They're definitely illegal. Okay, there's the Aries. Make it like this one. That's what it's like. Okay, with the point. Now, I don't know how authentic these plans are, but we're going to try to make up a little block. See, the idea is when a rudder comes up, you want to V it in so you can fill that little ditch. You don't want to have a mountain top there. It's always better to fill a ditch than have a mountain top. You sure these are the real area? Do you have one of those warranty art plans? Yeah. The tail is different on warranty <clears throat> arts plane? This is the Ambroid Air. Is this the Ambroid Aries? No, this is the This is the one that was in a magazine. Whatever magazine it was in. I don't know, it's very confusing building an Aries. You think it would be one Aries, but there isn't. Look, there's even the article that's right the on Ambroids. the Aries plan. I believe that's the Ambroid stuff. No, I don't know. Not familiar with that enough to know. Yeah, I think this is the Ambroid one. Well, the pointy make, tail is the Ambroid one. Make it look like make it look like whatever you want. I wanted to show is how this this needs to be tapered in, so we have something to fill. The way this was, it was in fact it's still up here. We got to sand yeah, some it's more. It's got to come in right it's, there because you'll On never get rid of that. <clears throat> hey, there might even be some stones in there too. Yeah, well, tar is an effective sandpaper. It worked real good. It worked real good, in fact. Save all that money on sandpaper, just fly into the ground. <coughs> now, this stuff's already uh, dry. This dried well. Let it dry a little more. Let's see. I took. You're going to probably have to add some more. Oh yeah, do it in thin layers. Do it. Flat spot on that. Do it in layers. What I did, I dropped a few drops of thin CA on here, let it kick normally. Just hit it with some sandpaper. I want to see if I can seal that. And then, of course, the trick is, can we can we blend it in and flare it in? Little, little, one little bit of material at a time is probably the most difficult thing to do in uh, in all of repair work. Is get is repair an open bay. You can see all I did is layer after layer of thin, thin and thick CA here. Try to build up a little material so the material is just a little bit higher than the paper around it, the, the clear around it. And because this is all, Dave made his own pearlescent paint with light coat. You hope this is this is going to all be compatible. Yeah, actually, the only thing on here is that DTL stuff that isn't compatible, huh? What's that? That clear that you put on here is the only oh, thing that's not light coat. Chroma coat. Now what seems to be working here, I tried to block sand it in this direction, and you keep hitting this cap strip, which is kind of a nuisance. I took out the old the sanding dowel, and I'm trying to hold my finger here to keep it from gouging in while Dave's working on the rudder. Again, this may or may not work. I don't know. This is this is one of those maybe things. This is not a guarantee. This is like doing a heart transplant on a guy 90 years old. You don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> But having this curve allows me to work this curve in a little bit better than normal. Actually, it doesn't look bad, Dave. White. Yeah, now what I'm doing, don't, just hold the plane steady for one second. Put a little bit of thick CA. We still have some low spots, but I'm just kind of letting this kick off and let it go out onto the area that, that we really haven't repaired yet. And what about hard to soft? Well, we put the green stuff on. That'll take care of that. Where you are now, it's hard, but it's so thin, you're not going to get the oil can effect. If you were to make this hard, like where, where a cap strip ends, that's where it wants to crack. Oh, that's good. That's kicking off nice. Now I'll do the same operation, sand it, go over it again with the dowel, and then I'm going to hit this with that green putty. 
Now just go slow. Now what you could do, you put tape on the rudder. Yeah. Okay, put tape on the spot so you don't run the sandpaper and go right. little by little by little by little. Don't try to, you know, knock it all off in two minutes. Come on, Stacy. Come clean. All right. Here's the truth. We went to see her play in a nightclub. She played her first professional Come gig. On. Ah, ah, get on the video. No. Professional musician. Her new stage name, Stacy Rose, sing for us. No, come on, let's get to work. Okay, boy, see, Same see what distracts me. Ship it to me. Oh man, you see what I have to deal with? What holds up production here in the, the Stuka factory? Okay, you got the letter written. Hello. What's going on here? I've got about ten layers of that CA sanded yeah. on. Say. Yep. But there's still a little divot in there. You feel it right around yeah, there? You, yeah, right there. Now, because we could fill it with the green, you know, the green stuff, mm -hmm. but. But I'd like not to have to fill it. I'm going to try just dabbing in thick CA there and sand because then all the material will be one consistent material. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the CA and the green, I don't know because of this other stuff if that's going to all be compatible. But it, it looks like the CA is a perfect, has good compatibility there. So let's just go with putting more and more layers of thick CA on and then I'll work my way out and start fixing that tip. I mean, I, that isn't the, the, like, the easiest way to do it, but I think that's going to work in that case. There's this one little spot, and because I want to try to, I feel like I'm, I'm walking on thin ice here, getting this compatible, and it's not being affected by this, this Ditzler clear that he has on here. So I'm going to just keep filling. I want to get that filled, because that's the one. If we don't get that right, we have a re-lettering job. And then we'll work our way out and start working on that hole. The only way you can screw this up, Dave, is if you happen to hit it with kicker. You know what I'm saying? If you hit this with kicker and it goes, it's gonna go up, oh, right? Then you're screwed. As long as you don't hit this with kicker, I think you, I think we're gonna get away with this. We'll write this up for stunt news. In fact, I gotta send that column in later today. Let's see. When anyway, that's gonna work. That's what's gonna be fun. You just leave Dennis Rodman alone here, boy. They get our column ready for stunt news. Oh my God! More stunt news, more columns. Ooh, that's nice. That's good. Okay, Dave's got this all sanded. A coat of thin CA. How many coats? What? Two or three coats of thin CA? Okay, and then some of the green putty. Where the hell's the putty? We had it around here anyway. A couple of coats of this. Whole five nine. 6-0. We'll give that a little time to dry. Now you could start working on that nose, blend that nose in, and we'll get a little green stuff up on our nose. Now what I did here is a pretty creative little thing, and I don't know if it's going to work. I took a piece of sandpaper, bent a little fold in it, and slid it up underneath there, and glued one side. So now one side is glued and one isn't. I'm going to let that glue kick off, and then I'm going to try to get under here with a pin or a razor blade and pick this up so that this will dry, and then I'll try to fill this area in with some thick CA. This one filled in, you almost can't feel that. It's almost perfect. Okay, tell me the truth. Is your father a cheap bastard? Uh. Yeah, 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 he sure is. Does he beat you guys up a lot? Yeah, he's a child abuser. <laughs> Come on, Joe, defend the kids. Oh my, anybody that, anybody that knows you. Go, go blame it on your mother. Nice kids. Yeah, blame it on anybody but me. Look at this kid. He thinks he's windy of the future over at the Ertnowski desk. They're going to put 4,000 volts in there and electrocute you. You can't do pictures for windy. That's why we can't. Just let the weight of the... Yeah, I'm just, just holding it in case it decides to take a... Yeah, no, it won't. If we do this, little, even if you glued a knife in, it doesn't matter. You need tip weight anyway. <laughs> See, I'm thinking of folding that's like, it. That's like the Dave, the Dave Cook uh, Craftsman Phillips head propeller blades. No, no, I haven't heard it. You did, oh, that's right, you weren't there. All right, hang on, we'll get a little glue in here. Worst that happens is we have to cut this bay out anyway, so what the hell's the difference? It's a no-win situation. So, why well, your father's not here, you want to tell us anything about Joe Bucci? Yeah, kids, tell us about Joe Bucci. 
Does he take you to McDonald's and buy you French fries? No. No! <laughs> When it comes to those little toys they give away, is he cheap? Like, he doesn't want to go for the extra dollar for the toys? Yeah, that's right, Wendy. Okay, pull that razor out. Wiggle a little bit. Okay. Wow. We might have we might have lost the battle and lost the war here. What is that? Yeah, it looks okay. Just put some thick in here. Let this kick off under normal catalytic action, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay. Whoa. Now just, what you gotta do though is just build it up in thin layers, little by little by little. Don't get impatient. And go out beyond the, you know, out into the paint maybe a quarter of an inch or so. The Q-tips, what it does, that dust in the Q-tips kicks it off nice and slow. And just let it sit for, you know, if that's to sit 10 minutes, just let it sit. But if you kick it, you know what's going to happen. Boom, instant popcorn. Okay, you got the green up on the nose. That's ready to be half an hour or so. Half an hour on this. This is probably dry already. Ooh, you got that nice. That's going to be good. See, this is what we're trying to do is have one thing drying while we're working on the other, one thing drying, working on the other, one thing... So we can rotate from one to the other, to the other, to the other. Okay, this is the first coat of the uh, the green putty being sanded out now. We went out to dinner, had El Norte dinner. So Dave's probably got good indigestion. Got that. Guaranteed. You got the first coat that should be dry up on the nose. And this should be ready for, actually ready for some more sanding and some more. This was an amazing repair. This looks like it's going to be perfect. Have to write about that in stunt news. Yeah, I think that's going to be just fine. That's coming okay? Yeah. No problemo. Always work from the top down, then you don't wind up scuffing up you know what I mean? Work from the side that you're repairing onto the side that you that's already repaired. Otherwise, you wind up scuffing up the whole the part that doesn't need to be repaired. Now we're not going to do much more with this tonight, but we will get probably this sanded and another coat on tonight. There was a little hole on the bottom we had to fix up to. I don't remember. There was one yeah, on the bottom. One little hole. These, for all purposes, are fixed. That's just cosmetic now. I'll put the green stuff, let it dry overnight, and be able to finish that off tomorrow, and maybe even get the paint on it. Okay, you now, Dave. This this is Monday morning. Dave sanded this. He stayed up last night. We went to El Norte and got everybody has indigestion today. Yeah, that that came out real nice. In fact. What you want to do is let's try to get a coat of primer on this this morning. And while this is priming, what Dave brought his other plane down here. This is going to be the new one. I'll go through this later on a tape. This this wing, from sitting in a damp basement, wound up having some dihedral and a twist that we got out by zona sawing the top part of the wing and then spreading it, putting in a piece of 64th plywood and re obviously re-glassing it. He even put an extra ellipse in here. But... I think right now it's about perfect if we looked at this yesterday. I looked at it yesterday. What did you have? Water in the basement, Dave? In that rainstorm. Yeah, we had a big storm here and that wing turned into a pretzel. We only got five inches in my basement. Only five inches. I, I used to live with five inches. But anyway, one of the things that I wanted to mention is if you're ever going to put a wing together and glass it, what's a good idea is to try to do it within a time frame that you can get it glassed get some dope on it and get the silk span on it all within a very narrow time frame and this way then when it when you put it away maybe instead of putting a basement you could put it in the attic or someplace where there's less dampness that might be a good tip now the fuselage this is one we made uh, what did we make this a year ago something like that he's got a new canopy mold to go with all the canopies that's kind of a slick looking canopy too kind of a cardinal looking canopy and we're going to make a mold this is the turtle deck this is the solid piece. We're going to try to make a, uh, and I'll get on this later. We want to get the Aries outside drying. 
try to use up a Spitfire mold up in the front and maybe even a Spitfire back and make then a custom cowling and he's got the thing over on my bench here some kind of a custom cardinal kind of cowling mold we'll try to make the plug in a mold and maybe he'll even leave that with me and I'll mold him up the cowling this will be uh, something I hope that will fit all the cardinals then if we finish this off this will be kind of a hopefully a generic fits all the cardinals mold we may have that in, in stock real soon too so for the next couple of days these are our little projects to work on he also has the flaps the blocks the shells this will be uh, one more thing we can add into inventory here so all right without without wasting any more time we'll get over here and try to get this Aries cranking out and primed I, don't, I really don't even think we I think we could have gotten away without using any of this but I'd really like to get it on there because we have plenty of drying time today let it dry for a while by the way this stuff usually dries in a half an hour but it really is a lot better if you can let it dry yes. some extended length of time like overnight this is sanding real well yeah the tail sanding good I've noticed that too whenever I've had to let this stuff dry overnight in the morning it just you can see it's coming off I don't know if you can see this like powder it just powders right off and yet if you sand it the same day maybe even an hour later sometime it does like last night it wasn't powdering off was it it was kind of coming bad. off yeah but it was it's so much better when you let it dry overnight so maybe that's a good tip you can put in a bank for these kind of repairs too Yeah, that's coming right off now. When it's powdering like that, then you know, you know you're going to get a really nice blend out of it. It's ready? I think so. See, the main thing is where you have the blend coming up here. You can't even feel it. Can't Close your eyes. Here, it. right here, I can feel. The, the very edge, you got a little spot there and still needs to be. This is a, and you got a little give it one more wipe just a little bit because that'll dry that's so thin it'll dry in two minutes right up in the front can you feel it you may as well make it you yeah, know right there yeah we got plenty of time and just stuff the powders just dropping right off of that boy that's nice now, as long as you're gonna wet sand this it doesn't take long and you can get the M600 out and some 600 paper and get a final blend on this. What you're really looking for here is to get the edge feathered. That it, At no point in time does it just end. It kind of feathers out. By the way, this is... You can even see the rib coming through here. This, this sandpaper repair is really... I don't know if we've uh, come up with a good idea here. I mean, it's best to always use your hand to check. Don't use your eye. Your eye can get kind of deceived, but your hand will pick up any little spot on here. Now the other reason when Dave did this, to always put hot stuff on the raw wood is you know eventually you're going to want to get the area wet. If you didn't put the hot stuff on the raw wood now, and if you sand through into the raw wood, you want to wipe another coat of thin CA, make sure you're not into raw wood there. Because what will happen is when you go to prime that, wherever it sees raw wood, it's going to be a dry spot. You know, it's, it's the most critical thing is getting that edge feathered in that you can't feel it. And right now, even though we've done this to silk span, it's, this I think is going to be really a good repair. I don't think that's going to be a problem at all when we get that finalized. You're about on the last sand out there, and we can start That's masking it. out. Yep. The nose, we're coming up on the last sand out here. Well, you got some stuff drying up there. You no. got stuff drying no. on the nose? No. no? Okay, then we'll start getting this masked off.
do too, Dave, is just come right around the edge here. I don't want to mask off a line. We'll just spray right around the edge. And actually, I wouldn't. I would. Ma I would leave it out there too. So in case we come around, we can just fade that into nothing. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, I know what you're saying. So you yeah, don't have yeah, a yeah. dark purple line stopping right there. So. Okay. Bring it so to we'll here. just mask the pink. Just mask. And just mask try to shoot pink. it that way. Okay. And you I got an airbrush, right? Yeah. And I can shoot it this way. Okay. There you go. Yeah, okay, that's what I, because when we do the white, I want to end at a cap strip. And if you have to, maybe we can put an ink line there. Okay, one masked off. We're going to try to spray the purple on this first. Dave's going to finish up the nose here, and then we'll try to get the purple on that, and the purple on the tip of the rudder here, all in one shot if we can. Yeah, that should be real good. A little teeny. No, if it needs another coat, give it to it now. We're early enough, and early enough in the day we can get all you want on that. Now here's where some of our experiments that we did last week are going to pay some nice dividends. They brought down his wood. This is this is all eighth, right? Should be. I want to go through this. For for this much of a curve on a turtle deck, sea grain will be fine. It's not going to make a radical curve. So what I'll try to do is use up the sea grain pieces on the turtle deck. And he's got plenty of them here, so it's not a problem at all. And I want to see, this looks like a, nah, not really. I want to try to find two A grain pieces that I can put a joint in. Remember that test I did to see if you could put a joint in? Well, it's nice to know you can put a joint in the wood. Okay, you got basically all sea grain here, so we can use, these we'll use up on a turtle deck, and I'll look through my pile of wood. Here's one that maybe not. Is one we can use for a shell. You got two you can use for a shell out of that whole pile. So I'll try to use up the sea grain pieces on this turtle deck mold. In fact, we're not gonna even have to put a, a parting line on it or anything because I can use the mold itself as the parting line. So what I did, I took the original mold, cut up two pieces of that Dave sea grain, and I wanna get, what I'm gonna try is to try to make both of these pieces at the same time just to see if it can be done. This is kind of an experiment, we'll find out. But I need to put a little bit of an angle in the top joint, so I'm gonna do that with the belt sander. Try to get it as accurate as I can. You can see what I roughly did is just try to get as much of that as I can and I'll get the rest with the sanding block. Put it on the edge of the table and work it with a sanding block just to get the last little cuts. Place we can use up that real sticky tape. Anyway, I want to get this right up to the edge and get a long sanding block. This doesn't have to be too fancy. In fact, this is probably getting into a little bit of overkill, but since this is a test, now I can use this take my sanding block and I can get this edge real straight since this will be either tape holds it in position it should be anyway or you can have your you know your faithful companion Tonto hold it in position because you really can't get the last little bit up to an edge on that belt sander just too delicate and you don't get a straight edge this gives you a nice straight edge Now the trick is, even though this tape isn't really sticky, I want to, again, this is an experiment. We have never gotten away with doing this yet. And we may, that may be true this afternoon, too. What I was going to try to do is mold both pieces at once, and you can see how, I, I don't know if you can see, I have the groove there, and the tape will kind of hold it in position. I thought maybe I could glue this. Again, I have to look at how to do this, but I don't want to put the, I put it in the mold. Then I could soak it once it was glued, in fact, what I can do is, these are the kind of things where you have to kind of invent the technology as you go along. You, it, nobody obviously is going to be writing about this. 
you've got to invent it yourself. Or you have to subscribe to the Dave Midgley uh, Cardinal videos or whatever. Anyway, we'll see how this works. I want to try to get roughly this shape. Let's see if I'm clear, close enough. And then run some glue down here. Now because the, you would think, of course it's not really true, but you would think maybe because this tape is up here I'll get a nice glue joint even as a side benefit. No guarantee. And the whole idea of this is I want to try to hold this while I'm pressing that glue joint in. And I guess that really is part of the stuff that intrigues me about all of this is being able to come up with these little inventions and ideas. Now, it's going to be tighter in the back, so I'd like to pull this tighter by how much? By a lot. Okay, I've tried to simulate roughly, if, of course I can't really get it as tight as I want in the back, roughly get that shape. But with the tape holding it now, I'm going to run some thin CA right down that joint and just let it kick off without any kicker. I'm going to do this right over the garbage can, in fact, because I know what's going to happen is this stuff's going to drip. You just run it from one end right down the other. It'll probably make a sloppy joint up by the tape. Okay. I'll tell you, if anyone thinks doing this is easy. Piece of cake. Masking these scallops off. Yeah, do it. Let me tell you. Just do it. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, but once somebody does it, they know. If they I know just by looking. For every time I lifted the tape up and re-put it down You've when I was doing this. Oh yeah, it's a pain in the ass. That's why I used to make patterns for all those old cardinals. We don't even care if that kicks off with powder in there. Okay, now we made that shell up and it looks looks like it's just going to need a good, give it a good soaking. It's getting it. Ammonia is good and cheap. Even if it splits, we'll, you know, we can always go back and make another one. Not a big deal to make this. And what we're going to do is after this, after Dave gets this totally soaked, I don't know where the hell the mold is. Here's the mold. Okay, we'll wrap it with an ace bandage, put that aside, and we'll be ready to spray the Aries. He's got the Aries all aluminized, all ready to go here. Let's see what I did. Because this is a new thing, I, I have too much of an angle on one side. I put too much of an angle in a top piece to really confine this. So what I'm going to do is press it down and let it split. And just use this as I got to know in the future I have to make that angle much, a much less of an angle. But we could still get the both pieces pressed down in one shot here. Now what I did, I ran a knife down here just to just to split it. It's still a throw that split too. But it won't really matter. We're gonna re-glue. Ooh, it slapped over here. It'll give me actually probably two separate shells by doing it this way, but again I'll know from doing this in a a couple of times, I'll know exactly what that angle has to be. Just wrapping this with an ace bandage. We'll put this aside to dry and then we're gonna try to paint the Aries. Looks like the old the old airbrush is clogged up there. No, uh oh. I got plenty of other uh, spray guns and stuff we can use. Okay, now if we get this up by the heat and vent, this may be dry in a relatively short time. And even if we have to make another one, there's no big investment in time and energy. Just squeeze that together while we're waiting for it to dry. What I did, I have an old shell. This is one I molded up out of two thin pieces of wood that just, we're going to try to use it. Basically because the wood that Dave has is C grain wood and not A grain. I wish it was A grain. 
and this is real nice a grain stock so i get the old trick just get the, the edges fine we're going to make up the nose ring and this has all been on here he's cleaning out the gun should be ready to paint the aries any second now the first color on the aries and we're going to lay this out next step is going to be to lay it out for a nose ring See, a lot of the things when you get into a day like this, a lot of the things you need to figure out are just to make the maximum use of the time. You don't want to waste the time getting to a point where everything's drying and now you're just sitting around. Yeah, this will work fine. This is just long enough, too. I had to cut the back off. It was all chewed up. But again, that's what's nice. Now, if right now we had to carve a block and hollow it, this day's shot and maybe part of tomorrow. But right now, perfect. Now I'm going to do the front of this the same way I did, I got out the old jar, I sanded that out. I'm going to take and lay some couple of pieces, just like I did on my top block, to leave a little extra meat up here. Now one of the things Dave wants to do, and we're going to try to figure out how exactly we want to do it, he wants to put those reverse, uh, how many do you want to have, one or two? Just one. Just one of these, reverse, like a channel right down the middle like on the tweener and like uh, obviously other planes the olympic is one that i can think of but first i want to get in a couple of couple of layers of extra wood just so we have more wood to work in when we blend in the spinner and maybe even a rib right behind the where the back plate is going to be the second piece i think i'm going to add one more to this now give me just enough meat up there. Okay, we're ready to paint, Dave. Okay, you got the white in there. You're going to do the white first. Now, the only problem I've ever found using an airbrush is when you go, you go, the paint doesn't stick. When you go, if, if you were to put masking tape over this later, you run the risk that you might pull the paint up. It goes on pretty, it goes on neat, but for all purposes, you'd like to never have to put masking tape on top of something that you've airbrushed. In this case, I think we can beat the system in other ways, but that's the one downside of airbrush work. A spot right there that we missed. Okay. Well, you still can do it with the All green right. putty. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see it from here. Yeah. It's not okay. Good. It's not good. One of the ways you can make an airbrush a little bit better is by putting really, really thin paint in it. Or this is thinned out pretty well. Yeah, and what happens though, because you're not using any pressure, you're not getting any, any real amount of chemical on there that's making a chemical bond. That's the only downside that I've found to this. Now when I do the sea fire, I want to do a lot of the camo work with airbrush this time. And I'm wondering how I can do that. I'm going to have to do figure it out ahead of time so that I don't wind up with, uh, that I go to put tape on top of it and whoops, it all comes up. And maybe one of the ways of doing that is to put some retarder in. When you're using an airbrush, use a lot of retarder. That might be, uh, so it'll take longer to dry and get a better chemical bond. Again, we want to try to make this just fade off in each direction, because this is a di obviously is going to be a difficult color to match.
I like to do, Dave, is cut one out. Okay, no, no, don't even trace the second one. Cut one out. The grain is going this way. And then just glue. Take that piece and glue it on with the grain going the other way. Then you use this as the pattern. When you got two the same, it's hard to line them up. It just makes it a little bit easier. Oh, well, okay. And again, we're making it. I was just going to block them out so we had a small piece to work Yeah, okay, but don't worry. We have plenty of plywood. Thing is to always try to use two pieces of sixteenth instead of one piece of eighth. You get one extra grain lamination that way. Okay, we're ready with this shell. That's about all we can do with this guy. Now, I want to start laying out the bottom shell. But here's one of the things, too, that's significant about this molding stuff. We took out some of the other molds. And this is Dave's fuse. And it turns out, you have each one marked. The Spitfire is an inch shorter and a little bit thinner, so we won't be using that for the bottom. The sea fire is real close, it's within a quarter of an inch, almost has exactly the same contour. And we could even use, in a pinch, we could even use what was John DeTavio's bubble canopy top lock, which almost fits perfectly. So what it is, now Dave can make the decision as to the thickness. You can see some of these are thicker. The sea fire is thinner. The sea fire is the thinnest one. And the Spitfire is thinner and just a little thicker. So what it is, it gives us a lot of choices. We can mold up this bottom with a lot of choices. You can make a very deep bottom, a very shallow bottom. And once you have, I'm guessing, all you would ever need is with three different block molds. We actually could use the Spitfire. This is the Spitfire Turtle Deck. We probably could use this to make his shells and then just run a little block down the top. So. By having all these molds, we have a lot of choices. And what we decided to do, we're going to use that sea fire. The sea fire bottom, I believe, is the one he wants to use because it gives you the, the lowest profile. Then what we'll do is when we take it out of the mold, we'll take and run eighth inch tape along the edge and trim out another eighth inch. So in effect, this will even drop down into the fuse even further down by about an eighth of an inch decided, for instance, you wanted this to be, I'm going to make sure I'm doing this on the right one, if you wanted this to be just a little bit higher, one of the easy things you could do, I have these, these are 30 second balsa, and this makes the mold in itself, they're trimmed down to the size of the mold, so I can add a little dimension to it, and, and we're trying to match Dave's profile, this would allow me to add a 30 second and a 16th right onto the mold itself. And now if I mold the piece, it's going to be just a little bit bigger. So I have an awful lot of choices here, and they're all good choices. Okay, we're ready to lay out. This is going to be the bottom block. We got the last of the four-inch pieces of wood. It'll be your job, Dave, to call Riley Wooten and find some four-inch wood for future projects. Put it in your inventory. But any wood you buy now, buy four-inch wood. So you can use any of it for molds, you know what I mean? You can always cut it to three inch, but buy four so you'll have it for molding purposes. Future projects, because the three inch wood, this way you can put the joint in it, but why go through the aggravation? This is the last of the good four inch one. Just to be part of the team. Get plenty of ammonia. Look at this guy's spring when you put the ammonia on him. Upwards of a hundred thousand dollars just to get there. Are they crazy? Sounds like NASCAR. But no crazy. Nothing's crazier than Reno, boy. Who also come to the desert to watch this. Anyway, we love these Reno videos. Good thing to get inspired. We're just talking about Dick Woolsey building a Miss Bardall. Bill Little's building a Mustang. I know Gerald Champ has a Mustang getting under construction. Well, well on the construction. The are high, and the ride is wild. Oh, I love the These smell of this stuff. Ordinary <laughs> people. Come now and experience. Come now. Thrill. This guy in the Corsair, he's dead. He's dead now too. He got killed. I tell you, there's a Corsair down in. Uh, 
Essex County, right by the Circle Burner Field? No. This guy bases a Corsair there. It's a B-25 and a Corsair. The anyway, you need videos to inspire you when you get to this point in time. These big long days in the shop. Okay, this is ready to mold. We took our cameras out on the course to watch them run. Giving this wood some extra soak in here. This is a real, real nice piece of wood. I don't want to take a chance on splitting it. Yeah, oh, I love it. Look at the gear doors of power. Oh, man. Big tsunami. George, eat your heart out. Did he ever finish that? Not finished yet. He's been working on it like a madman, man. Need some inspiration, I'll tell you, in a long day work. Is there anything that look at this come in for a landing? Oh, listen to that engine. Big tsunami. Oh my god. If that doesn't inspire you, forget it. Nothing will. Alright, we're ready to wrap this. I just gotta find that other race bandage. That should be soft enough now. There was a new breed of aircraft. Okay, Dave's got the nose ring roughed out, getting the motor mounted. We needed to give it a little extra clearance in there. Get this lined up. He took the 90 degree off with the belt sander and ready to put the nose ring on. Pretty much the same we did on uh, the two CFAR fuses. Okay, now my only criticism here is where you have this little piece, we want to get that blended into the nose ring just, just enough. You what, know what this I'm guy saying? here? Yeah, so I can... Oh, this I whole can, thing has to blend in, doesn't it? Yeah, we'll blend this in first, because then I want to take it on a belt sander okay. and get the sides blended in, and then we can uh, we can kind of trial fit that top block. We get the top block over there somewhere, ready to do a little trial fit. And I did the last couple on a belt sander, they just worked bingo, you know, no problem at all. The trick is use a dull belt, don't use a brand new belt. And everything I have here is dull, so... Including the company. <laughs> oh, mean. Uh, okay. No more El Norte. El Norte for you. Boy, we both have gas today. El Norte gas. Okay, this guy, we have to, the new bottom block sitting here drying out. The top block's up here by the heating vent. We're right at about at the end of this video. We're going to probably close this out right about now. Pick this up later on today after lunch or whatever. We're ready to start assembling this, getting all the blocks and shells and everything in place, all the finalization stuff. And then we'll probably, if, I hope, try to get some of the work done on that wing with the corrective, whatever we want to call that, corrective dihedral surgery. That's all been done. That's all done, so that's ready to sand out pretty much. we got to make some horns up. But mainly, getting this done with shells is so much easier, quicker, faster, and cheaper than, than blocks. I mean, I never get sick of bragging about that. Unbelievable. That's pretty good. By yeah. The time yeah, see, for right now, if that doesn't fit exactly, it's okay, because you can move it forward or back. Oh, you, got enough, going, you got enough You got enough material going right. back? Okay. It's going to be just about right. Yeah. Well, that's what that's what kept a lot of people years ago from making shells is they thought everyone had to be different. Like, and when you look at it, you look at even all the small 35 planes, they're not that much different. And where they are different, you can you can just blend in a block. See now, if you want to bring that up, just see how far you've got the spot marked where it can go to the back, and you could trim that off. But what I'm we saying, we don't want to trim it yet. No, what I would do rather than that is wait till you get this all, and we get this, the sides done on right. a belt sand, and then just sand a little bit, a little bit until it just right. blocks right in, exactly. and you got that contour just right. Yep. I would rather do it in little baby pieces than try to do it all at once. Just gonna start about back in here. You don't even have to mark it. I don't need the mark to do it on a belt sander. It's just. It's a done deal. Well, I do. Blends right in. It's just a lot easier to work on a sanding table with uh, with the motor out of it. And you're going to use them. That's why I like to leave the nose ring just a little bit bigger. So leave that pen line on there. Then you have a little bit of uh, a cushion and take the last little bit out by hand. 
Okay, we will be seeing you on the next tape, so have a great time. We're closing in on this, I hope, I hope. Sitting here watching all these Reno Air Race videos and trying to get inspired. Oh, oh. Eat your heart out, look at this. How can you watch this and not be inspired? How can you want to build a plane that looks like a uh, an ironing board? In fact, Lyle Shelton's winning record was only eclipsed by the multiplicity of wins laid down by Daryl Greenemeyer in his Conquest One Bearcat in the early years of Reno Racing. I did have some wins in the past, but I've also had uh, a number of broken engines around this uh, place, and I've come falling out of the sky quite a few times, sometimes on fire, sometimes not. But I've, uh, I've uh, had my share of bad years and good years, and some bad years start out good, and some good years start out bad. This airplane was wrecked. Back yeah, back you think he could be a stunt flyer. <laughs> Anyway, see you on the next tape. This has been a lot of fun. Got a great session going here. I found this airplane up in Indiana, near Valparaiso, Indiana, in wreckage, and I bought it for $2,500 plus 5% California sales tax. It got started air racing at that point, and that was 69. We came up here first time September 69. It would have been $20,000 in the aircraft. So basically, it was $20,000 at that time. Uh, we came uh, came up and went racing. And then uh, I came in, I believe, fifth place that first year, 1969. Slow but steady. Just take one little cut at a time. You know, don't go from the front to the back. Go from the back to the front. Now, get it on a nosing. Now, twist it. There you go. That's a great tip. Oh, isn't that clever? Yeah, isn't that? Now, don't put a gouge in the back. Get it laying so it's almost flat. The trick is don't use a new sanding uh, belt. The belt has to be done. Yeah, just quit. You got it? Works perfect, right? What a guy. Now, the other side, it's difficult to do unless you're left-handed. Kind of a pain in the ass working from this. I find it. What a way to end the video. He lets go of the fuse, it flies up into the wall and gets broken. There you go. You got the, the touch now? What a guy. This is something you can do. First time he puts his fingertip into that belt, he's going to learn the hard way. Just like Windy. That works good. Love those Reno Air Race videos. Keep them coming, guys. Got a whole stack of them now. Blue Angel videos. From Bob Black. Oh man, we got stuff to inspire. Watch. Just watch this technique. This is a good one. And this you can use on any plane, even a Nobler. It doesn't matter. Because it's that last little twist right up at the nose that That's you need to get. It. That's what does it, baby. That's what makes the price of the video $45. Don't <laughs> worry, you're getting your money's worth out here. All the time you save, you can have a, a whatever. Pizza on Dave Midgley. Anyway, we're going to go have lunch, and we'll catch you after lunch. As soon as he gets this done. Cool. It works good, doesn't it? I knew you'd be impressed. Even my father would be impressed with it. Yeah, I know you're fine. Yeah. This is drying up real nice. Hey, we got two more days of working together down here, so it should be a lot of fun. And we got a lot of videos to watch. Keep that Dave grinding away. And even on the next tape, I'm going to show you a magic trick. How to make this a brand new Vico spinner. Even though it's all squashed, it can be made just like brand new without a lot of work. Not even a challenge anymore. The old, the old fix to it. Now, years ago, when I had, well, years ago, I had to fix them because I couldn't afford new ones. 
Anyway, this won't be much of a challenge at all. We will be doing that on the next tape. And you can see that what happened when that hit the ground. You notice it even belonged to me at one time. And you gave your golden love. Look how much down for us these planes had. A lot of neat stuff on these drawings and plans. We have a good good thing for our ink line pad.